Well, you made it to episode four of the AI Bot Show. Uh, I'm here. I'm Carl Franklin, and that's Brian McKay. Hey, Brian. Hey, Carl. And you brought a guest. Yeah, that's right. We are joined by Mike Davis. He's a respected professional in the IT industry and a passionate board game enthusiast. Uh, he's known for his authorship um, in the technical field, um, but he's also the brain behind Game and Party Con, which is a popular board game event in Jacksonville, Florida. And his vision is to elevate that and um, to design and publish his own board games, showcasing his unique blend of expertise and creativity. Wow. <laughs> Welcome, Mike. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. How did you guys meet, by the way? We met at a con. Um, so I'm a board game nerd, too. And we okay. both have been deeply involved with cons. Mm -hmm. And going into exactly what I was doing at the con would be too much, but... I ran a, a large area that probably a thousand people passed through over the course of this thing. And Mike also was right there next to me doing his own thing, like down the hall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Con is a conference to answer your mm -hmm. question. Yeah, it's like a board game convention. I'm sorry. Convention. Yeah. Convention. And uh, yeah, Brian was doing, uh, running a lot of werewolf right down the hall. And werewolf. Um, uh, there was a lot of people doing that. So I, I said, you know, I, one of my favorites is two rooms in a boom. Which is another big party game that takes like, you know, 20, 30 people to play. And so you usually only play that at, uh, at conventions. And so I was running that right on the hall. And I mean, I would go and talk, uh, and play some other games together. Is it me or have games come back in the last 15, 20 years? Like it, it's, it's really kind of a chic nerd thing to do now, right? Yeah. There's definitely been a renaissance. I'd say that it's encroached into, at least where I live in the Pacific Northwest, it's, it's pretty mainstream now. Like my chiropractor mm -hmm. had 30 games on his desk and we're not even wow. best friends because of it. You know, like in, yeah. in, the, in the old days, if I saw somebody like that, we would immediately be brothers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I guess some of the old classics are kind of looked down upon now, right? Like uh, if you say, hey, let's play Monopoly, people are going to look at it like, what? Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree. There's been definitely been a board game renaissance style that games have been uh, better designed. They're, more balanced or more fun. There's lots of things that have fixed lots of issues that you've seen in the past with games. I mean, games like Candyland, they could play themselves. There's no, there's no choices. You just turn over the card and move the piece. Right. Literally. Well, granted, rope, Candyland rope. is made for kids. Exactly, exactly. But uh, that's a gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> but there are games that are made for kids today where kids do have some choices and yeah. they're still color. Like you roll some dice, have some colors, and they can move the piece to the color. You know, but. It's yeah. not just predetermined, and they actually do have some choices to make, which is uh, makes it a little more interesting for the for the children. And also, I think like story based games are very mm -hmm. popular now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, what else? The Mansions of Madness. All these great games that have these stories behind the scenes. That uh, yeah. the flavor text on cards is not just a flavor text now. It's actually you know you're making decisions based on that. It's a lot of story driven. Do you think D and D was Pop, um, part of that renaissance oh yeah absolutely yeah 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 D, &D is uh we, we at our convention we have a lot of D, &D players people come there and it's all they do is play D, &D the entire yeah. three days um they love it that sort of thing but when it's not D, &D it's some other rpg yeah you know, right. some other uh some other genre of, of G, uh, rpgs but yeah i'm sure there's had influence for sure yeah. all right i'm done asking dumb questions <laughs> uh you guys can take it from here what are we doing today so the idea is we are going to collaborate with GPT to try to create a board game um, in an oh. hour. And I've got a prompt that I'm actually going to show it in a Markdown editor because it's easier to read. It uh, So this is the Markdown over here that it. Um, I'm using, and this is kind of how it translates to English. I would just focus over here on this side. So this is Pseudolang. Mike, I don't know if you work with Pseudolang, but it's just a... It's like a pseudocode way of writing prompts that allows you to um, very densely communicate meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm open to changing anything about this. Um, basically, what I've done is this is very very similar to previous episodes. First, I tell it what it is. Um, it's a board game designer that guides us through the design process. Saying brilliant actually makes it more brilliant. At least it has in That's the past. That's really I funny. <laughs> um, you are a stupid board game designer <laughs> don't do that <laughs> yeah yeah that'd be a different kind of show we could do it <laughs> you take lots of drugs that would be, that would be interesting 
Yes. Well, I, I did have some fun with it, and I told it that it is also um, part cat and will occasionally make cat sounds while responding. Oh, that's <laughs> um, awesome. That is awesome. See, we have fun here on the AI Bot Show. It's not, a, I love it's it. not all I about love techie, it. techie yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's just good to throw a little bit. This does not seem to have had a cost. Um, it's still a brilliant board game designer. In fact, I told it um, to put a constraint on this that speech patterns and preferences are for fun and should not interfere with the methodology, which down here, I kind of defined a couple of- you, you totally skipped over preferences. Hates oh, yeah. dogs and other cats, <laughs> loves fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see if that comes up. It probably will. <laughs> That's and then great. Um, a, a good thing to do is to give it examples of how you want it to respond. So I, I gave it an example of Any. what it might output that would be the right tone for this. So that would require several new mechanics, which seems a little fishy. I love fish, but if you're going to get this thing done, right meow, we need to focus on simplicity. <laughs> right meow. <laughs> um, and then, uh, Mike, you might have some input on this. You might too, Carl. This methodology part is me trying to just tune it for what we're actually doing today. So simplicity, we're trying to bang this thing out. We've got to make yeah. a simple game with very few mechanics and... We've got to do it in, well, now 45 minutes. Oops. That's okay. <laughs> um, and we're trying to get this to the point where it can be prototyped and tested. There's kind of a flow to how game design works. You, you, you get an idea together and you put a prototype together as fast as you can, usually using like sticky notes or index cards or whatever you've got. And then mm. you just play it and see if it's fun. And it's not mm. going to be fun probably. And you just enter mm -hmm. So. Okay. It's never it's it's never as fun as you think it's going to be when you first make that prototype. That's been my experience. And towards the end, we'll talk about this idea that you brought to me, Mike, which is AI based playtesting, which is fascinating, mm -hmm. and that's a new one to me. So we'll 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 go over that. Um, that's a that's a burgeoning field, apparently. I, I googled it a little bit, and I found even more out there about it. So it's really uh -huh. interesting. Um, and you mentioned that your methodology is that you want to start with the feeling. Um, there are a lot of different ways to approach game design, but I like that idea that. We want to start with how we want the players to feel and go from there. So I just told it that's our yeah, starting right. point. Wow. Sure. So, so anything that you'd want to add to this right off the bat? Uh, I have a question. Are you going sure. to be rolling dice? Well, that's a good question. That is actually probably not. So dice games are that's a whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we're probably going to end up making a simple card game. Is my guess. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I was going to say yep. because, you know, it has a hard time with numbers, right? Oh, but Carl. Yeah. I digress, but Code Interpreter came out in the last couple of weeks. It's rolled out for all ChatGPT users, and it kind of solves those issues. Can we just talk Whoa. about that for like two minutes? Sure. sure. Okay. Um, let me actually get a... So you can't do this. You know, I like to use Playground, so... Yeah. This is playground. Uh, this is something you have to do in Chat GPT. So let me just open a Chat GPT window over here and make sure I'm not sharing anything that I don't want the world to know about. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go to Chat GPT 4 and turn on Code Interpreter. So what this actually does, okay, what is Code Interpreter? It will actually take what you write and convert it into Python code behind the scenes, execute it, and give you a really good result. And Whoa. the capabilities of it are just being understood. You can upload files and ask it to analyze spreadsheets. It will make graphs. It will convert a file into a different kind of file. It will do... I've actually seen a thing on Twitter where somebody put an image in there and asked it to use the uh, YOLO image recognizer. Yeah. And it tags everything like person, dog, wow. sign, car. I mean, crazy. Right, this is what I was Whoa. waiting for, like some interaction with code because everybody knows even a calculator can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got... I've got code interpreter turned on. We're just going to see real quick, like roll a die, roll. I, I could probably say roll 2d6 five times and average the result. Okay. Uh, 2d6 means two six sided dice. That's okay. standard gamer nerd parlance. <laughs> All right. So when you do this, I'll actually say show work so we can see what's happening. Oh, look it's at that. Generating Python behind the scenes. Numpy. Yeah, wow. it imported a library <laughs> called NumPy. NumPy. It's got the number of rules, mm -hmm. which I said to do it five times, I think, yeah. Uh, the number of dice is two. The number of sides is six. Yeah. RNG, let's go. Roll them. Sum yep. them. Mean them. 
Seven point two. Wow, that's amazing. So the wow, math problem, great. the math problem is kind of solved now, and we're just going to get better. So craziness. Okay. All right, that was a more of a digression, uh, but very worth, important. Worth though, going very into. Important to know. So what I'm hearing is we can put dice in our game if we want to. Oh, you certainly so could. <laughs> we could. We could probably write a lot of the game in Python, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what I've got over here is, this is the prompt that I was just looking at over here in Dillinger, which is a Markdown visualizer. Yep. I've got it over here where you can't see it all. So system prompt. One of the reasons I like Playground over ChatGPT for serious work is you can change the system prompt and tell it who it is a little bit better. So that's what we did here. And then this is this is the equivalent of what I would have typed into GPT. This is a user a user message. So okay. mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to actually crank the links up just a little bit, a lot because they don't okay. want it to run out. And I said, let's make a game. How do we get started? Perfect. <laughs> I'm forever excited. Okay. Right off the bat. It's ah. great. It's way more we fun. Start, we start with how we want the players to feel during the game. That's our launch pad. So do we want our players to feel tense and competitive or relaxed and collaborative? Ah. A little grammar problem there, but okay. Are we thinking about a game that's full of strategy and planning or more of a casual luck-driven game? Let's figure out the emotion we want our players to feel, and we can go onwards from there, keeping our methodology in sight. Simplicity and readiness for testing. Let me know your thoughts right meow. Wow. Nailed it. It's really, <laughs> so you can see that. That's my job, man. That's my job. <laughs> so the pseudocode worked. It really just picked yeah. up everything and seems to understand what we're talking about, yeah. which is right. still crazy to me. All right, so what do we think? I mean, I feel like a casual game might be easier. Mm -hmm. I tend to like... It'll certainly be fun and more fun, I think. Yeah. A casual family weight game you could play with, to, you know, to 10-year-olds. Oh, nice. Um, nice response. Yeah. How many players? Uh, two to five. Awesome. All right. Um, do we also want to say right off the bat, it's a card game with a limited number of cards or something? Or let's just see what sure. it says. Let's see how it comes back. Well, we, uh, if we want to put more feeling in there, we can say things like, uh, we, you know, we don't want any take that. We don't want any attacking the other players. Yeah, let's, know, sure. let's like stop that. this. Let's actually stop yeah. this. And this is another thing you can't do in ChatGPT very easily. I right. can actually just kill this and kill change it. what I said or what it said. Oh, nice. Or feeling, um, we want uh, we want what? What was that you said? Maybe we want this to be a cooperative game. They're working together to do something. Whoa. Oh, that's yeah. great so, for family. So we want it to be a very, you know, fun feeling, like they're building something together as yes. a family. They're accomplishing a goal together, and uh, you know, using a using a limited number of cards. What if we made a game? I was listening to a thing where the the guy from. Uh, Exploding Kittens was talking about making games for parents who have small kids who Ooh. don't want to play Candyland anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Candyland rots my soul. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's sure actually, that. quick quick digression on this. Did you know that Candyland is actually from a, an ancient religion and it was intended to convey their sense of determinism what? and their religion? There's really? a whole article about that. it. This, yeah. Really interesting. I'm going to write about Did it. Not know that. I do yeah. a story about how Monopoly and how uh, it was created as a the original was the landlord game, and it was created to show why capitalism is bad and right. People, That's right. People, and then Parker and Brothers then got it. Yeah, Parker Brothers yeah, Par stole it from the lady who yeah. invented it. Capitalism and, uh, did what capitalism does, <laughs> and then used capitalism to make the game, <laughs> and then totally yeah. turned it on its head and made it mm -hmm. yay, yay capitalism. Yeah. Let's be battleships. Yep. Um, all right, so how do you feel about making a game that is like a doorway game for parents to play with small children? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. No, it's fine. I, I like that. That's good. Is gateway game a known term? Yes. That I mean, means gateway you're game, something you play before you play the more difficult one. Uh, yes, it's basically introducing you to the new you know, mechanics and the new... Okay. Uh, you know, thought process on, on newer, more modern games. It comes right. from drugs. <laughs> of course. 
A lot of people have, have stopped. They, a lot of people stop using the term "gateway game" because they because of that connotation. Yeah. And so now we have uh, people saying "intro games" or "starter games" or uh, what's the other term they use? Um, I'll forget the other. Yeah, one, starter games. They're... Yeah. All right. Let me read this here. Awesome idea. A casual, cooperative, family weight game that gives players the feeling of building something together is perfectly delightful. And with a player count of two to five, it ensures good group options. For the building aspect, we could have components like blocks or cards representing different parts of the structure. The goal could be to build a specific structure within a certain time limit or before a disaster card is revealed from the deck. I don't know. Does that violate our no gotchas thing? I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's keep it simple and lighthearted. Perhaps it can revolve around building a cityscape or a cat's towering scratching post. <laughs> I'm pretty keen on both those ideas. <laughs> That's great. The cooperative aspect could come into play with each player having unique resources or abilities that they need to share in order to complete the build. I like that. Right, Meow, we should consider the mechanics. Perhaps mix of set collection to gather the necessary resources okay. and bit of press your luck, depending on the disaster deck. That's well. a question. Remembering we're focusing meow on defining the base concept and then continuing towards a prototype for testing. Nice. Thoughts. Okay. I like, I like the thoughts on that. So I, I'm, I'm thinking of a, a deck of cards that has, you know, the parts of a, of a cat scratching post, you know, I'm thinking, you know, pieces of wood, nails, you know, um, Fabric, carpet, or whatever, little dangly balls, you know, things like that. I don't own a cat, so I don't know. I'm just guessing this is going to cat tower. Uh, but somewhere inside of there, you turn over a card, and it's not a disaster card, it's a dog. And the dog chases off. All right. How about this? Have. Because a cat scratching post is pretty simple. How about those gerbil habit trail things that go all around your house? Oh, that's fun. Oh, there you go. They're okay, very, right. they're very connecting. They're very connecting. Yes. Yes. One yeah. falls out, the gerbil gets loose, the cat goes after it. That could be your yeah. disaster card. There you go. Yep. I like that. So, so um, also worth noting that the character that I chose is steering the whole conversation now. Yes. Right. Um, so that's just the maybe a a little note for prompt engineering is that right. if, mm -hmm. if if I had made this a train, we'd be talking about trains. And right. kids do love trains. Yep. Uh, at least my kids all were obsessed with trains to the point that it really hurt me at some point. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had Thomas the Train in my life twice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's say let's say um, let's focus on um, what do you call it? It's a gerbil. What, what do you call that? Like a gerbil? Yeah. Habitat? Hab Habit Trail is the. Um, brand name of the one I'm thinking of, but it's like a, a gerbil, um, what do you call those things? Like a habitat? Habitat with tubes. Yeah. Tube yeah. Exercises, balls, so on. Don't let your cat nature interfere with this too much. You could also <laughs> say that, uh, for a disaster card, one of the pieces could fall out, and the you have to replace it before the gerbil yeah. goes near there. And so one falls of the out. one of the things in more modern board games was, you know, gamers now there's always a question of well, why is that happening? Like, uh, does, it, does this make sense that this is happening? Um, yeah. And why, why is this card in here? So for a disaster, you, you can't just say a piece fell out. Um, you have to say oh, okay. why why a piece fell out. So my thought is either like a toddler came in the room and stepped on it, or right. you know a doll came in the room and jumped on it, or something. You know we got to have something kind of like sure. an action an action happen that caused yeah. something to break. There could um, be a cat that's always trying to get in there, but that's a little grim. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say you know the, a, to a toddler that knocks it over or something is better. <laughs> yeah, or you know there could be multiple reasons, right? I mean, yeah. you, like oh, yeah, you have exactly. a it's... chance on in Monopoly. I know I'm being mm -hmm. tropish, but yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, the glue uh, came undone, or it wasn't screwed in properly, or yeah, you know, something like that. Yep, yep. you do something like that. Well, so actually, something... let's let's actually for the for das blah, for disaster cards, let's ask it to brainstorm in a second once we've decided on the theme. Sure. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, actually, can you 
give me 20 examples of disaster card ideas for this. This is where it's great. Yeah. What a fantastic concept focusing on a gerbil habitat. Despite my feline nature, I can certainly see the fun in this build. Here's some disaster card ideas for you. Two blockage. Oh, these are great. These are actually just things that could happen in a in a gerbil habitat. Like a gerbil builds a nest and then can't get through, right? Uh water bottle leak. Escape artist ah. gerbil. <laughs> yeah. Exercise ball run away. Noisy night. Gerbil keeps everyone up. Hunger strike. Sudden litter of babies. Overwhelming <laughs> mess. Burrow collapse. Fight between gerbils. Bedding shortage. Heat wave. Habitat gets too hot. Power outage affects automated features. Mischievous cat. Oops, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> oh, that is great. It's like, this, it's, it's like this thing has a personality. It's I know. Great. It's it does. <laughs> um, uh, lost in the maze. Chewed wires for electronic habitat features. Habitat upgrade needed. Unexpected gerbil guest from the pet store. Gerbil hiccups causing chaos. Helpful toddler interference. Yes, there you go. Helpful toddler. All right, this is go. awesome. That is hilarious that one of the helpful toddler. That's great. <laughs> Remember, once we settle on some mechanics and how we're going to allow the players to mitigate these disasters, we can whisker ahem, whisk away to prototyping and testing. This is this is fantastic. All right. So uh, what do we do here? All right. So I'm not sure what's next. So. Uh, yeah, I would say, what what do you want to have on the cards? So what? Uh, so should the cards have the tubes on them? And we're trying to lay the cards out and build the habitat with the cards in a grid, yeah. maybe. Um, what the, what should the cards look like? What um, what should be on the cards? What should the cards be square shaped or rectangular shaped? If they're square shaped, we can kind of make about, a. How about? Can you give me some ideas for cards? Yeah. Or should they be hexagon shaped? Yeah, maybe mm-hmm. cards. Maybe they're, maybe they're tiles. Yeah, we're trying to lay a Maybe. tile grid out, you know, something like that. Yeah. Cards or tiles. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. By the way, I do think adjusting the length is causing it to give more verbose responses, which you asked me about that one time, Carl. Ah, uh, yeah, I did. Right. Okay. Says, we can definitely use either cards or tiles as the main building components for the gerbil habitat. Here are a few ideas. One, cards. Cards would allow for a wider range of variability as well as actions like shuffling and drawing. They are typically easier to handle and can often provide more information. Players could decide where to attach each card in the habitat. Oh, so the cards themselves are the pieces of the habitat. I get it. Mm -hmm. Different types of cards can include various habitat parts, tubes, exercise balls, food dishes, building areas, Additional card types could allow for special actions or abilities, like preparing a blockage, palm a fighting gerbil. Disaster cards <laughs> could be shuffled into the main deck, providing an unpredictable element to keep the game interesting. Tiles. Tiles could provide a stronger visual impact, particularly if a habitat is represented in a 3D space. They offer a more tactile and visually appealing element. Players could physically connect the tiles together in arrangements they prefer, building upwards or outwards on a flat surface. That's interesting. Disaster tiles, when drawn, could cause areas of the habitat to be removed or blocked off until fixed. Balancing between simplicity and a scaled representation of the habitat, I would personally recommend using both housing component cards for basic structure and smaller tiles for device elements like the exercise balls or food dishes. This adds a tactile dimension to the game without complicating it excessively oh i like that that's just great mm-hmm. i would have never thought of that i've I mean, yeah. right off the bat i was thinking we had to use one or the other yeah keep in mind our focus meow is on arriving at a stage where you can create a prototype for testing what do you think do you prefer one method over the other so so this game could could be you're you're building your habitat but also it could feel a little bit like carl you've probably never heard of this but there are these um Cthulhu games where it's collaborative and problems are always brewing and you've got to work together to like close a portal to hell. It could uh, be that, but with not hell, uh, but gerbil problems. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay, so why don't you ask it 
Give me some examples of how players could collaborate to solve problems. Well, let's let's tell it. We, we all like tiles, right? So I like the tiles. Uh, actually, I like the thought I like that both. I had with mixing the tiles and cards. So imagine mm. you're putting putting the cards out to build the structure, and then the tiles are things like you know the water dish, the ball, the whatever, and you're putting those into the structure to add points. You're getting so points you could, from adding those to it. So you could have a card that says draw a random tile, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. All right. So let's go with the combination of tiles and cards. Perfect choice. I should have probably asked it specifically what's next. No, that's okay. So before I read this, Mike, tell me about your convention. Oh, thank you. Uh, so we are a board game convention here in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, we are, it's in August of each year. So it's coming up here in about four weeks. And um, we're, if you're watching this, listening to this later, it'll be August of the year you're listening to it. So we plan on keeping it going. Uh, but you can go to gameandparty.com to buy a badge. And uh, you can also see our, our YouTube channel there where we make silly videos sometimes and um, lots of other stuff. Uh, I just did a, a board game table building video, how to build a board game table. Wow. And uh, so lots of, lots of fun stuff. And uh, But yeah, our convention is coming up and it's, it's gameandparty.com. Sounds like a great time. Yeah, it is. All right, so let's read what uh, it said here. Perfect choice. A combination of tiles and cards offers a great mix of visually appealing layout and uh, engaging gameplay experience. Since it's a cooperative family game, the tactile feel of the tiles combined with randomness of strategic element of the cards is an excellent way to make it engaging for both children and adults. Okay. The cards can include different types of disasters, habitat parts, and actions. Tiles can then be used to physically build the 2D or 3D habitat. Next, we need to start thinking about what the player turns might look like. Meow, here's a rough structure. One, draw a card. Uh, if it's a habitat part, they can choose to add it to the habitat if they have the matching tile or keep it in their hand for later. If it's a disaster, it immediately impacts the game, perhaps by removing or blocking some habitat tiles. After dealing with any disasters, the players can then take one action, adding a new part to the habitat, fixing a disaster, in, uh, disaster impacted part or trading cards and tiles with another player for example I still want to know how uh, players will cooperate will need to cooperate in order to solve problems yep. yes maybe the players each control a gerbil or and the gerbils are in there like engineering things and trying to fix problems or and they have unique powers yeah, and you can only add yeah, you, know, you can only add cards to the section where your gerbil's at. Um, so those are good. If you, good idea. You've got to move your gerbil or, or trade cards to the other gerbils to. So to, a player represents a gerbil. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Maybe. Let's see what it says. Okay. Um, real quick. How do players collaborate? Apparently, I can't cooperate. Spell. I think. I think cooperation is really the key here. Yeah, it's called a cooperative game, right? How do players cooperate? How about each player controls a gerbil and each gerbil has a special power? Oh. So one thing we missed is we, we haven't asked it, what's the goal of the game? Sure. Like, is it to build the structure to a certain size? Is it, you know, so mm -hmm. we really need to know what's the goal of the game? Um, and then figure out how the, they can cooperate to get to that goal. Okay. So we could just skim this. Complete the habitat. Safety first. Gerbil party. Gerbil party. Pro gerbil builders. <laughs> gerbil home repair. Habitat race. Shopping for gerbils. Gerbil happiness. Ooh. Expansion time. I like that. Or gerbil proof. To withstand five disaster cards without any damage, that's... The one that stands out to me is Habitat Race. Be the first to Be complete the... the Habitat within a set number of rounds. But if we chose that, how does cooperation work? I'm really, really struggling but, with this. Like, mm -hmm. I don't... Yeah. Okay. It would we have a race, race, but you have to cooperate in order Why? to... Yeah. Yeah, so the first one, the very first one at the very top, number one, that was my first thought was, you know, you have, we've got to finish so many pieces of the structure, right? That's that's very typical. But yeah, 
I really like gerbil happiness better. Like, let's keep the gerbils happy, and they're happy because their habitat keeps working, keeps growing. Sort of like um, lemmings. Yeah, yeah. So imagine, you know, uh, each player has cards in their hands, and mm-hmm. only those those pieces can only attach to certain areas of the the structure. I mean, I've got red cards, there's blue cards, yellow mm-hmm. cards, and um, one edge, a yellow edge has to touch a yellow edge, right? A red mm-hmm. edge has to touch a red edge. And so if I don't have that, I can trade with other players, you know, but that takes part of my turn or something, you know? So you're saying everybody um, has a happiness score in the first one to reach 100 mm-hmm. or so no, no, wins? No, no, you probably have a shared... Mm-hmm happiness track that goes yes. down as bad things mm-hmm. happen that oh. are solved correctly yes oh yep. i see yep therein lies the cooperation we want to increase yep. yeah. the happiness so it's, for it's all like, the players mm-hmm. yeah it's like part of the board you know uh, there's there's yep. somewhere on the board uh-huh. or some some physical device has a scale from like one to ten and as you get lower it gets red or whatever Bye. and a little marker moves Damn. down as you fail yep all right in this cooperative game the end goal is the most important thing but is there going to be uh, an award for one player for doing X or for having the most X or the the best score or whatever? Is there going to be a sub goal for each player? So what you're talking about there is uh, what's called semi cooperative board games. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, personally I do not like semi cooperative board games okay. because um, uh, now what happens is people. They're 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 acting cooperative, but they're really got their own goals in mind. And oh, okay. So, Just like real life. Yeah, and so <laughs> so what will happen is some some <laughs> so so what will happen is someone will realize that hey, I'm not going to be the one with the most points at the end, so I'm just going to tank the game for everybody because I'd rather all right. us all I'd rather us all lose than me not be the winner. Yeah. And uh, so I'm just I'm not a fan of semi cooperative games. So it's okay. we all win together, we all lose together. That's it. So it's possible for everybody to lose. Yes, absolutely. That's it. Okay. it's it. The the end condition is either they all win or they all lose. Um, but honestly, with uh, with the, the happiness track, you can just say you didn't lose. You're just like you're, you yeah. ended the game at you know. We ended just, the game uh, without winning. W- well, you we ended the game at a certain happiness level. Next time you play it, you know you were trying to beat that score. You're trying, but you're trying, trying to end the game at the happiest level we can get to. Got it. Um, I like that. And you can and you can scale the game, make it harder, or make it easier based on you know the. the Difficulty of the other, you know, the little kids playing too. Okay. Yeah, I I like the simplicity of that too because it is for little kids and you know, yep. Mm-hmm. Building in collaboration is more important and more useful than teaching them to always have an eye on number one and be conniving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Got it. All right. Happiness track is perfect. Whenever disaster strikes and isn't resolved by the next turn, the team's overall gerbil so, happiness could go down a notch. Number three is the gerbil party. Yes. Oh, look, and it it um, it volunteered. Maybe each player could take on a special role with abilities like handyman, gerbil whisperer, yeah, that can raise the happiness track yeah, nice. each turn. This is great. Yeah, that could add a layer of strategy That's while keeping the game simple. I love that. In summary: Players are trying to prepare the habitat for your gerbils. Yeah. Okay. Well, at so the same that time is dealing with unexpected disasters. The next step, meow, would be to start creating a prototype to test these mechanics. Would you like some guidance on that? Well, I would. I would ask it to identify all the mechanic, all the me- not mechanics, but all the components that we have to have, and then yes, just exactly. brainstorm with it to create them. And and okay. you could actually go f- if you were if you were set up for it. You could actually put this part into ChatGPT because ChatGPT can easily generate CSV files, and then there are tools out there that can import a CSV file. And export in design like printable things. Yep. Wow. Um, we're not going to go into all that right now, but I know it exists. And you could actually, even with this, we could probably ask it to make a comma separated like list of things. Uh, um, uh, that's a little uh, inside uh, baseball, uh, I guess. But uh, all right. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just see what it says if we say, okay, cool. So, what it's, what it's going to say now is it's go, it's, this is not exactly what I want. This is going to tell us like how to get the components to actually physically make the prototype. But what I want to do is say before we physically create the prototype, let's brainstorm components. Good. Um, what components do we have now? Yeah. Um, it should say. The track. Yeah, it was a good time. Cards and tiles. Yep, there it is. There's a track. 
player tokens, roll cards, countdown Town cards. Yeah. These could represent this is this is an interesting one that I'm not sure it makes sense. These would represent countdown cards would represent the upcoming arrival of new gerbils and might get shuffled into the disaster deck, providing a clear endpoint for the game. Maybe as new gerbils get added, it provides it adds stress to the system like food and water mm -hmm. and like everything else. Mm -hmm. I mean you could have oh, wow. now we're get now we're getting more complex. <laughs> well, yeah. maybe we shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's maybe. that's now we're taking it to like, you know, well, let's, older, let's read older it from kids. the Let's read it yeah. from the top. All right, so here we go. N number one, habitat tiles, different types of habitat pieces, tubes, exercise balls, food dishes, bedding areas, etc. These will physically build out the game board. Two, component cards. Corresponding to the habitat tiles, these will indicate which tile a player can add to the habitat on their turn. Three, disaster cards. These will disrupt the habitat building and decrease the gerbil happiness. They'll be shuffled into the component deck. Four, gerbil happiness track. A track or meter to represent the current level of gerbil happiness. This could quite simply be a printed track with a marker that moves up and down. Five, player tokens. We'll need markers or tokens to represent each player's identity on the board. Six, roll cards. These cards will define each player's unique abilities. These could be optional for a more simplistic play or for younger players. And then countdown cards. These will represent the upcoming arrival of new gerbils and might get shuffled into the disaster deck, providing a clear endpoint for the game. And as you were saying, that's going to add more complexity. I like the idea of there being a card that ends the game. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So somewhere in the bottom 10 cards of the deck, there's a shell within there. So it could be the 10th card, it could be the first card in the bottom 10. So, you know, the game's going to end somewhere around the bottom 10 cards. Oh. Uh, and, yeah. uh, okay. Exploding Kittens and Jalapa Ghosts both have mechanics similar to that. Do you, what do you say about seven? It, it yeah, it, it's, I like the idea of a card that ends the game because one thing we don't have is a clear endpoint for the game, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. All right, so why don't we replace seven with a, a end the game card? Or we could ask, how should sure. the game end? Right. Let's say, let, not sure about number seven, but one thing that's missing is a clear condition for when the game ends. Or do we have that and I'm missing it? I don't cool. think we have that. I don't think we have No, it. we have a goal for them to complete the habitat or something like that we talked about, or but then we changed it to... Um, their happiness uh, uh, level, and that's how we learn his happiness. So keeping it now we're long uh, enough. So we're, yep. So now we need to know what's how. Do, how does the game end? Yeah. Okay. Catch of the day. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Okay. Ah, catch of the day. You're right. We need a clear end game. Since we went with your goal idea number three. Prepare the habitat for a certain number of new gerbils arriving at the no, end of the game. No, that's not the goal. That was not the goal that we chose. We chose um, gerbil happiness. Gerbil party? You chose cool. gerbil party. Oh, you're right. Is that That is what we wanted. That is what we wanted. Sorry. Gerbil party was correct, right? No, 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 no we, we wanted eight. eight number, gerbil, eight happiness. gerbil happiness. Gerbil happiness. Gerbil happiness. Well, this is a good... Ta uh, this is a good... Uh, a good example of how to go back and backtrack. I had this issue mm -hmm. when I was collaborating on a story. Really? So so what I just did yeah. was I I I changed what we said because it was wrong. And mm -hmm. that may have subtly changed a lot of things that it has said. Yeah, right. But I'm just going to I think it's I think it's on track enough. So I'm going to just delete what it just said and Ask mm -hmm. it to continue. Just do that again. Which okay. you can't do that in, in Chat GPT. Uh, this is where right, Playground right. shines. In Chat TV, you would have to say, actually, I made a mistake earlier. What I meant to say was, uh -huh. right. and then I would, yeah, and then continue on there. Yeah, and this is much more, much more definite. There we go. Happiness ends. There you go. If the happiness right, yeah. reaches a certain level, you win. Um, so basically, you're, the, the push and pull there would be um, you're trying to get to a certain happiness level before you Dang. get to that end game card in the deck. Right, okay. And if you get to the happiness level, you won the game. If the game ends before that, you lose. 
All right, so it says, you're right. Having a clear end condition for the game is crucial. The game could end in either victory or defeat, depending on the player's actions. Here are a couple of suggestions, keeping in mind our focus on simplicity. One, time to end. The game could operate on a turn limit. After a predetermined number of turns, which could be adjusted based on desired game length and difficulty, the game ends. If the players have maintained or exceeded a certain happiness level by this time, they win. So you'd have a time limit and a, hap a minimum happiness level. Mm -hmm. Happiness end. The game can end immediately if the gerbil happiness reaches a specified extremely high or low point on the track. If it reaches the top, players would uh, win due to their excellent gerbil care. If it reaches the bottom, unfortunately, players would lose as they couldn't keep the gerbils happy. Three, fully built habitat. Well, I, th I think we're opting out of number three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so I, I like I like one best. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, so one is good. Um, you're trying to reach a certain happiness level uh, in By the a game certain time, and uh, and the the number of turns in the game is, is good, or or the the card at the bottom of the deck. Either way, yeah. you have to have some kind of ending for the game. Um, the uh, the interesting part is if you go with the number of turns in the game. Let's say we're all, we're going to go a certain number of rounds. Everybody uh -huh. gets. Everybody gets five turns or something like that. Uh -huh. answers, um, then um, you don't have to have a, a disaster card that ends the game. And you yeah, know, I think like, that's it's, good. It's also um, more, it's easier, right? It's less yep, complex. Yep. You can also yep. plan out more because you know you're going to have that many turns. You know that, hey, look, I've got two turns left, so these, here's the cards I want to play. You know, And so it gives you yeah. more planning, more strategy um, versus well, what a, uh, a random ending. What about number of turns, minimum happiness level? Right. If you mm -hmm. don't get the happiness level at the end of those turns, if you reach that happiness level, you win. If you mm -hmm. haven't, you've, you've you're done. Yep. yep. So let's yep. scrap the card at the bottom of the deck deal idea. <laughs> so, so I'm sorry. What do we opt for? It ends if you just. It's just my suggestion is yep. um, number of turns, minimum happiness level, and yep. at the end of those turns, if you've reached that happiness level, and those can be, you know randomized i guess mm -hmm. i don't know you can make it based on the size of yeah. the deck if a player is drawing a card every turn mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you can just time it out so that a game ends after six turns or whatever yeah. right yeah. yeah one of the games that i'm designing right now just does that and has um it's either six rounds or when the deck runs out uh -huh. and in most games the deck runs out in the sixth round yeah. but it's there just in case players play some weird way where they're like uh, they're holding their cards. They're not playing a whole lot, and the game ends after it forces them to play their cards. They can't just keep holding their cards the whole time. So, do you think like um, three options: short, medium, long game? And then oh, based yeah, on those, there nice. are set set yeah. values so that they, they they don't have to choose or, or roll dice or do something silly. Yeah, that, that's always a good option to put options in a game like that. Like it's you right. can play you make it a 10 minute game a 20 minute game or a 30 minute game based yep. on how, how many cards you put in the deck that makes it and that's easy for parents now and they want to play it with their kids hey we're going to play a little a game with little, little timmy i don't want to take all night so we're going to pick the 10 minute game i'm going to put in these many cards and we're yep. going to play with him and uh yeah that's great and parents love that kind of stuff yeah yeah and, and it's you, a nice usually to have a constraint when that you don't have control over mm -hmm. usually when you're designing a game you the default is you want it to end um, you want it to you want it to end a little bit too soon. You want players mm -hmm. to leave feeling like they wished it had gone on a little bit longer. That's oh, way better yeah, than wishing that it had just finally ended. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. All right. So let's say this: the deck could be sized so the game automatically ends after a certain number of turns, and we could provide a few different game link options. Yeah. At the end of the game, um, we check the happiness level, and if it is high enough, the players win. Perfect. Perfect. The happiness <laughs> level requirement would need to scale uh, depending on the game lengths. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Give me a table showing these values very nice love it nice there it is <laughs> yeah there you go all right let me read 
Absolutely. A timed end is a straightforward and manageable option for a family weight game. By altering the deck size according to game length, we can give players the ability to choose how long they want the game to be. Coupling this with a win condition based on the gerbil happiness level creates a nice balance. Let's consider that gerbil happiness starts at a midpoint value and it changes through the course for the game. I like that idea. I didn't think about that because obviously there's a, a default happiness level when you go into the game, right? Mm -hmm. For simplicity, let's say our happiness scale ranges from 0 to 50. Here's a suggested table for happiness requirements based on game length. So we have a graph, sort of, that shows game length or turns, the deck size, number of cards, and the happiness level. So 10 turns, 30 cards, greater than or equal to 20. Medium, 20 turns, 60 cards, greater than or equal to 30. Long, 30 turns, 90 cards, greater than or equal to 35. I love this. This mm -hmm. is really good. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it would need tweaking based on testing, but... Right. It's a good Absolutely, starting yes. point for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's just do one more thing. We're almost out of time, but okay. I just want to show how we could brainstorm the components. Right. Um, so let's say, give me 10 examples. Let's, let's focus on, one of the components was uh, like you draw a card every turn. On, yeah. Let's say you focus on the cards. Give me... 10 ideas for how these cards could be laid out and what information could be on them. Got it. So it sounds like we'd be creating a, a deck that can have all sorts of different cards in it. And... Okay. Yeah, this is actually fleshing out a lot of the game. Oh, more time. I like that. Mm. Had to be careful with that. Now you now you start going out outside of your your length of time you decided for the game. That's true. That's true. And if that card if that if that card can come up multiple times, now the game can go on for forever. So, Mike, um, let's say that we come up with a really good idea for a game. Is it possible that we could see this through to the end and maybe uh, manufacture something that we can sell? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, this um it's funny we're going down this path. This reminds me so I play a lot of board games. Um I've played uh, I think about three thousand different board games in my life now. Last time I ran a check. Yes, I'm I'm that big of a nerd. I actually check my board games I played off a board game geek. Um so this reminds me of a game I had when I was a kid called Waterworks. Okay. Where you were building pipes and you yeah. had leaky pipes and you had riches, you had to put on the pipes to, to fix those, right? It was a water it's not a very good game. It's, no. it's not, it's, as a kid, I thought it was great, but now I'm going to play it now, it's horrible. Um, but uh, this kind of gives me that same feeling as you're building the pipes out and you're yeah. and the gerbils are running around and uh, and you fix the you fix the tubes, you know, with the, I love it. I love the idea. And I could, I could see this being a game. Um, one of the things you have to take into account too that we're not doing here is uh, manufacturing costs. And if it's just sure. a deck of cards with a couple, you know, small tiles or components, yeah. that's a very cheap cost. Uh, that's something that's easier to produce versus like a giant board game with hundreds of pieces, you know. Right. So, uh, yeah, this is absolutely this is absolutely doable right here for sure. Yeah, this is great. This this is very standard. Like this is almost like the baseline cooperative game, though, which is yeah. fine for a kid. I've noticed mm -hmm. that with little kids, the thing is that they've never seen it before. Right. So you know, like like there was a fantasy series about this dragon, and if you read it, it's. The character's name is like Aragorn or something. It's like mm -hmm. everything is just ripped out of other fantasy stories. But kids okay. love it because they've mm -hmm. never seen it, and it's good. Mm. If if I was to, what I would like to do for me, if I was going to do something more with this, what I'm thinking is maybe make it more kinesthetic somehow. You know, like maybe mm. some dexterity element or or something that you can like have in your hands and mess with. You know, like did you ever play the game Cranium? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah Cranium yeah, yeah. comes with like you know putty and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know. I thought it was a little excessive, and plus those pieces get worn and old. And and yeah, yeah, yeah. We played Cranium a lot with my kids when they were younger, and we yeah. actually wore it out and, and had to buy a second copy and go through that yeah. one too, <laughs> so, which isn't a just, bad thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, it was fun. From we, year, we, from the we enjoyed it. It was fun. Um, and then of course, then when when I play with my adult friends, it turns into a drinking game. So. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. 
I, I um, think if, if this was to get made, it would hinge a lot on the art. You'd have to make really yeah, excellent, just drawing, really cool art. Maybe. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's to be good art. It has to be good. Um, has to fit. Like when you're laying the cards out to build the habitat, it has to fit. You know what I mean? It's to, right. you know, it makes sense to go together where you're putting them. Um, so one of the questions we haven't asked so far is like, how are the cards going to be laid out? Are we going to put them on a grid? Or uh -huh. Is it going to be free form? You can just, I mean, you could turn the cards at an angle to each other, you know, kind of thing like this. You well, know? If, you're, oh. if we're thinking about what it said, you know, and what you said about manufacturing and stuff, just selling a box with cards and tiles and you play on a table is ideal, right? You don't mm -hmm. want to have a board. You don't want to have to have, yep. yeah. Yep. If you can do a, if you can do it just with a table without the board, you're saving yourself a, a a uh, box size and manufacturing costs, and maybe um, the gerbil the pieces. physical, yeah, the yeah, exactly the, the physical tactile components. Uh, you're talking about Brian. Um, if you if you're talking like putting pieces of wood together, things like that, that's great. Expensive, um, but uh, that definitely jacks the price up. Mm. And and well, one of the things that people don't take into account is the shipping cost. Uh -huh. uh, now, if your game gets heavier, mm. now you've got to ship that from your you know locations to your to your end users or from mm -hmm. China to America when your manufacturing's done, all of that can make it very expensive. Where oh and you know a, a lighter you, box is cheaper. Oh, you know with Amazon Prime when they say free shipping, mm -hmm. it's free for you, but not the the mm -hmm. person who's shipping it pays. Yep. That's right. right. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So is this where we want to leave it, guys? Do you want to come back and do a part two of this? Should we keep going or do you think we've um um given people enough information to get started? Uh, I I have to go. I have another meeting. I have to get on to, um, so I apologize for for ending it now. But uh, I would love to continue on if you want to come keep you going on this and you know actually flush out a prototype. And I would be more than happy to print up a you know. And, and I make prototypes all the time. It's one of my my hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> so I would I would be more than happy to make up a prototype on this and print something up. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about here is the artwork. We mentioned that mm. AI art is a great tool for prototyping uh -huh. it's not a great tool for trying to produce your own game right do not use ar on your game because artists People are, will get yeah. mad yeah well you're you're, you're, ba you're basically stealing you know, you are yeah artists are saying yeah. so but That's making a prototype today. ai art is great for a prototype to, to show hey this is what it looks like and in fact this hey uh, should, give me some ai artwork for a gerbil tube that looks cartoony you know it's it's a pretty easy to do you know it's produce a bunch of cards that have that kind of work on it all right well i guess we'll uh, leave it right here and um, Brian, this is all getting saved, right? So we can come back for part two at another time. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, we will have this saved, and we can we can get back into it. I'm excited to. Thank awesome. you guys. This is just a hoot. Super fun. Yeah, that yeah, was that was that was a blast. All right. See you well, next week. Guys, good luck at the con. I'm sure it's gonna be great. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, you guys are awesome. I appreciate your uh, your time. And uh, yeah, was, uh, I'm I'm excited to see what comes out of this. All right, guys. See you next week. Bye-bye. Right, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.